Uh, tonight, I want to introduce a friend of mine who is going to speak for us. When we decided to come to Belmont Abbey, it was, it was obvious uh, that I was going to uh, contact Dr. Ian Crow to speak to us tonight because not only is he a Burke scholar, but he is a friend of mine from the, the Russell Kirk Center, a, a affiliation that I've had uh, for many years. And um, they, they, are, they are great friends uh, of mine. And, and also, as, as Ian will explain, um, you know, if you're thinking about Cicero's legacy and uh, uh, heirs to the Ciceronian tradition, if you will, uh, Edmund Burke might be the best, ex one of the best examples of that. So Ian Crow is an associate professor of history at Belmont Abbey College and executive editor of the journal Studies in Burke and His Time, a fantastic journal. I encourage all of you to take a, take a look at. He's also a senior fellow of the Russell Kirk Center and director of the Edmund Burke Society of America. Ian's research, Ian's research interest is the career and writings of the 18th century Irish politician and thinker Edmund Burke, regarded by many as the father of modern intellectual conservatism and a figure whose thought was central to the writings of Russell Kirk. His publication, Patriotism and Public Spirit, Edmund Burke and the Role of the Critic in Mid-18th Century Britain, was published in 2012, and he was contributing editor to two collections uh, on Burke, one called An Imaginative Wig, I like that title, Reassessing the Life and Thought of Edmund Burke in 2005, and The Enduring Edmund Burke, 1997. Ian studied modern history at the University of Oxford and earned his PhD in history from the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. Before moving to North Carolina, he and his wife Sarah, who is joining us tonight, were uh, resident in Macosta, the, the, the utopia of Macosta, one of my favorite places in the world, where he served as program director for the Russell Kirk Center for Cultural Renewal and editor of the University Bookman from 2000 to 2002. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Ian Crow. I'm very grateful uh, to the board uh, of the Ciceronian Society for the invitation to come and speak to you at the end of, after this um, that splendid conference uh, this year. Uh, I did wonder at some point when I uh, heard what was uh, going on in Charlotte today, the festivities there, whether I was here because Edmund Burke is Irish. Uh, and if that's the case, then I'm sorry uh, for my accent. <laughs> the talk that I'm going to give is uh, really, in some ways, uh, a petition from the uh, Edmund Burke Society. And the overall question that I'm going to ask in this paper really is, does Cicero have anything to say, any value, if you like, for Edmund Burke. Can Cicero offer some value to, the, uh, to our uh, study and understanding of Edmund Burke? So in 1791, shortly after the appearance of his reflections on the revolution in France, Edmund Burke launched a blistering attack on the French revolutionary government, during which he called famously, uh, Jean-Jacques Rousseau, the insane Socrates of the National Assembly. Last year, for a conference paper, I traced that link through Diogenes the Cynic, Plato's Socrates gone mad, to a piece Burke wrote over 30 years earlier, in the 1750s, in one of his private notebooks. I proudly presented my findings to the conference and in response to the Ciceronian Society's kind invitation, I prepared to use the same link through Diogenes, adapting it slightly to a more fitting theme, shame. At that point, I found that my discovery was not in fact new. Indeed, it had been explored more than once by scholars investigating the connection of cynicism to the condition of political society today. After my panic had subsided, however, I found that 
Far from undermining my original intention, this situation played out very well in that overall goal of mine. Uh, how might Cicero help us to understand Burke better in the world today? Discussion of cynicism and the closely related, related concept of shame has spread in various directions in recent decades. In the Atlantic in 2021, Megan Garber saw the concept of shame as a means of destabilizing society, promoted by Tucker Carlson and others, making democracy's most basic demand, seeing one another as we are, impossible. Similarly, cynicism has been interpreted as a device, a kind of postmodern appendage employed perversely to turn the spreading of misinformation into a virtue. Some commentators see the solution to our current political polarization as restoring a sense of shame, following Colin Powell's famous comment in the 1990s. And others are promoting a return to a truer classical cynicism, rejecting the modern use of shame as simply a means for social elites to maintain exclusive areas of privilege against the shameless encroachments of the marginalized. So how do Burke, Rousseau and Diogenes fit into all this? In a book entitled The Making of Modern Cynicism, David Mazella included a chapter on Edmund Burke and the counter-enlightenment attack on the philosopher of vanity, in other words, Rousseau. One of Mazella's central messages is that the cynical media insider, or talking head, has become the, the perverse legacy of Diogenes' heroic philosophy and Rousseau's tortured quest for autonomy. The chapter on Burke supports that hypothesis by presenting Burke as the defender of prejudice in the cause of established political and social elites against the transgressive power of Rousseau's paradoxical morality. It's a phrase uh, used by Edmund Burke in relation to Rousseau and his ideas in 1791. In other words, Burke chose to interpret Rousseau's moral theories as the foundation in France of an elite cosmopolitan philosophy consistently hostile to the claims of popular prejudice, superstition, and ceremony. This predictable interpretation Mazella supports with the link I mentioned earlier to the notebook, arguing from the Red French Revolution back to the 1750s that, again, quote, Burke's project of defending the vulgar and their prejudices from philosophic scrutiny extended throughout his life. Now, the notebook in question, by which Mazella unwinds his retrospective accusation, is one of several to be found in the Burke archives in Sheffield. They were compiled in the 1750s and include material from both Edmund Burke and his close friend William Burke. Diogenes makes his appearance in a section titled by Edmund Burke himself, Several Scattered Hints Concerning Philosophy and Learning Collected Here from My Papers. A significant proportion of these hints relates to the value that should be given to custom in society, provided that customs are not followed beyond their just value. Between sketching an, ingenu an ingenuous and liberal turn of mind on one side 
and the importance of verbal decorum on the other, appears the famous story of Diogenes as related by Cicero in his Tusculan Disputations. I'm sure you know it. Uh, Diogenes is asked by his friends how he would have his body disposed of when he died. Throw it in the fields, says Diogenes. And the friends objected that it might be liable to be devoured by wild beasts. Then set my staff by me to drive them off, says Diogenes. One of his friends answered, you will then be insensible and unable to do it. So shall I be, says Diogenes, of their injuries. Burke declares that the philosophy behind this story has no substance. At the very least, the passing of such behavior into a general principle would incur obvious ill consequences, dead bodies all over the place. And he expands his criticism of the cynic by arguing how a philosophy that would strip our nature naked instills a shamelessness through its rejection of the wisdom in tradition, such that even love the sentiment and the thousand little dalliances that pass between the sexes may be spoken of in the gross way of mere procreation and turn all pretenses to delicacy into ridicule. The assault Burke makes on Rousseau's transgressive paradoxical morality in the French Revolution decades later is itself focused on the reduction of love to metaphysical speculations, blended with the coarsest sensuality. And for Mazella and other critics of the power of shame, it is exposed for what it is in that infamous description of Marie Antoinette in the Reflections, where the plumage of chivalry is employed by Burke to defend prejudice and establishment against the marginalized and the oppressed. But what happens if we reverse the connection Mazella is making here? If, when we reflect on what Burke means by Rousseau's paradoxical morality, we start our investigation from the notebook. In the very section where he mentions Diogenes, Burke himself reveals his thinking in a kind of paradox. This is what he says. I put my, this means quote, otherwise I keep wanting to say quote all the time. Um, a man is never in greater danger of being wholly wrong than when he advances far in the road of refinement. Nor have I ever that diffidence and suspicion of my reasonings as when they seem to be most curious, exact, and conclusive. The illumination delivered in this apparent contradiction is the importance both of the role of nature and the artifice of nature, or tradition, or customs, in shaping the knowledge that is designed to promote a virtuous citizen or gentlemen. In the first book of De Officiis, a work well known to all scholars in Burke's time, and as uh, one student reminded me, was always known in the 18th century as uh, Tully's Offices. Cicero himself sent the cynics packing twice and very sharply within a short section where he is focusing on propriety or the appropriate behavior in earning, what's the finger, the good opinion of those with whom and amongst whom we live. First, in relation to nature itself and its most careful design, the cynics attempt to squeeze a paradox out of the working of nature itself and propriety in the name of parts, as it were, the way in which we refer to certain natural uh, behavior 
uh, and whether we consider that as something that you know should be hidden from public expression and conversation or not. Second, the cynic's rejection of customs and convention offer nothing for us, since those traditions are guidelines in themselves without which nothing upright or honourable can exist. In each case, shame is vital in directing us towards a consistent adherence to modestia, that particular virtue. Now, I'm not in any way suggesting from that small piece of evidence that one might see Burke as a, as a new Cicero, whose future ideas and career might be interpreted through a good dose of Ciceronian scholarship. But I do confess to believing that this section of the notebook may reasonably be read as an extended discussion with the great Roman, with Burke drawing from Cicero in such measure and in such manner as shall suit his purpose. That is a quotation, of course, from Cicero himself uh, in De Officiis. Anyway, let's leave the notebook for a moment and widen our scope to the environment in which it was compiled. Before entering politics, Burke was pursuing a career as a critic and author. And his first serious opportunity there came through a connection with an unusual figure, Robert Dodsley. A teacher's son and former coachman, Dodsley was also something of a poet and a dramatist. And catching the eye of the poet Alexander Pope, he was set up as a bookseller in 1735. His business opened under the sign of Tully's Head. Why Tully's Head? Well, Pope himself was a great admirer of Cicero, as a cursory read through the essay on man will show. He was also a close friend of the patriot leader Lord Bolingbroke, and ambitious to fulfill the role as a philosopher poet, who would arouse in his works a patriot public spirit akin to Spencer's Fairy Queen and Milton's Paradise Lost. We can't know for certain why Tully's head was selected, but it seems to have been intended, in part, as a sort of mini-republic of letters of Bonnie Weary, associated to help defend the realm from the increase of corruption under Walpole. We read, for example, in Boswell's Life of Johnson, that Joseph Wharton, a poet and a cleric, observed that the true noctes atticae are revived at honest Dodsley's house. Tully's head, it seems, was a patriot cl claim against what had been the appropriation of Cicero as a propaganda tool for the government against its enemies earlier in the 18th century. Now, Burke became associated with Tully's head sometime around 1755, at a time of transformation in the politics of patriotism. Pope had died in 1744 and Bolingbroke in 1751. For a sizable number of historians, their vein of patriotism withered away to be replaced by a more vigorous form of nationalist politics, both in England and in Ireland. In Tully's head itself, there were shifts in perspective too. In 1753, Joseph Wharton published an edition of Virgil, lauding the Roman as a poet whose verse excelled in promoting public spirit through an ability to convey the simple and natural through sublime rhetoric. Three years later, Wharton adopted the same standards in the first volume of his essay on the genius and writings of Pope. But in this case, to deny Pope himself a space alongside Homer and Virgil as a 
arouser of public, true public spirit. Between those two works appeared Edmund Burke's first book-length publication, which was called A Vindication of Natural Society, and which is a loose but evident satire on the posthumously published philosophical writings of Lord Bolingbroke. Now, Tully's head was not a centre of advanced Ciceronian thought or publication. For Burke, it was, shall we say, the office of decorum and the home and training ground of the good citizen who wishes peaceful and honourable policies to prevail in the state. Quote from Cicero again. From here, Burke found his way both into the editorship of the annual register and into his first political post through that circle and his early writings were shot through with the reconfiguration of what it meant to be a patriot. Those ideas owe at least this place to the legacy of Cicero. Seen in the light of this reconfiguration of uh, patriotism, the historian Reed Browning has argued that Burke emerged as heir of the truest Ciceronian stream of court Whig thought in his adherence to the concept of natural law. There is much to be said for that point, and I want to develop it a little more by revisiting the notebook. In 1741, Conyers Middleton published his stupendous three-volume Life of Cicero. Towards the end of the final volume, addressing Cicero's religious beliefs, Middleton observed that there was not a man of liberal education who did not consider the religion of his country as an engine of state or political system contrived for the uses of government and to keep the people in order. The potential significance to Burke's thought of Cicero's approach to religion has received relatively little attention over the years, exceptions being Francis Canavan and Russell Kirk. And perhaps there is a clue to this neglect in an observation by the scholar Paul McKendrick who comments on passant on the legacy of Cicero's philosophic works in the 18th century that, quote, Burke and Cicero are each representatives of that rare breed, the intelligent and reforming conservative. In the notebook, however, we find a short essay in Burke's handwriting entitled Religion of No Efficacy Considered as a State Engine. And here Burke argues that religion can never operate for the benefit of human society, but when we think it is directed quite another way, because it then only operates from its own principle. As we confine the ends of religion to this world, we naturally annihilate its operation, which must wholly depend on the consideration of another. Men never gain anything, Burke adds, by forcing nature to conform to their politics. Again, this may be considered a tenuous point of connection. Though Cicero's attack on superstition and the, uh, on the nature of the gods and on divination serves a similar purpose in defending religion, which, uh, he argues, preserves the institutions of our forefathers and reveals some excellent and eternal being who deserves the respect and homage of men. In his own political career, Burke's liberal approach to religious toleration pivoted on what he called serious religion. It's a phrase that he uses first in 1773, so just about sort of seven, eight years after um, entering the House of Commons. A prominent supporter of relief both for 
Protestant dissenters and Roman Catholics in the early part of his parliamentary career, Burke was prepared to argue then that he supported toleration as a principle favorable to Christianity and as a part of Christianity. And yet, in 1790, he abstained on a vote on Protestant relief and then stridently opposed relaxing restrictions on Unitarians two years later, arguing that Unitarianism mingled a political system with religious opinions. Unitarianism, for Burke, failed the test of a serious religion, not primarily because it incorporated a political system, I suspect, but because it denied the revelation signified in the Trinity of the mysterious paradox that Burke saw underpinning artificial or civil society, that man is poised in tension with a foot both in eternity and time. In other words, anything that was not true or serious religion violated the definition of wisdom, which as Cicero had put it, and I believe was up there recently, was the knowledge of things divine and human and of the bonds of union between gods and men and the relation of man to man. That's my trinity, as it were, here. That sense of serious religion gives pious and authentic meaning, as far as I can see, to the apocalyptic scope of Burke's warning in the early days of the French Revolution. They have begun. And it is high time for those who wish to preserve morem majorum, customs, to look about them. The revolutionaries with their paradoxical morality, after all, as he says in the reflections, threatened the very spirit of a gentleman and the spirit of religion. It seems that whatever Burke's project may have been in defending the vulgar and their prejudices against such threats, it was not merely an attempt to avoid philosophic scrutiny. So what conclusions uh, might we reach? I hope I've offered to some extent means, opportunity and motive for a long-term and active encounter between Cicero and Burke. In one sense, of course, that connection is widely accepted. His oratory, his critiques of British imperial policy, his self-identification as a novice homo, even his incorporative, in, innovative conception of party in politics. But these are so often still seen by commentators as a kind of patchwork of rhetorical associations, seized on by a politician of opposition and then increasingly a politician of reaction. I wonder, however, if we might push the theme a little further and find in Cicero ways in which we can combine more closely those features that have already been identified uh, in Burke's thought, not changing the substance of Burke's ideas, but releasing an interpretation of patriotism, the good citizen, and justice that lifts it above the sporadic clouds of revolutionary conflict and reaches from the notebook to reflections and beyond. And then finally there's shame. In a shameless world, it seems to me, Tully's offices are empty. Yet as some of my students noted in a conversation we had recently, to be ashamed is not to be shamed but to recognize the reality of a divine law that guides us through a mysterious dispensation. And that returns us 
to Burke's paradox, I think, in the notebook. A man is never in greater danger of being wholly wrong than when he advances far in the road of refinement. Nor have I ever that diffidence and suspicion of my reasonings as when they seem to be most curious, exact, and conclusive. In a sense, Burke's paradox here is a contradiction turned into a self-enhancing and socially uplifting contrariety, something that may not only be proposed and believed, but proved beyond any reasonable doubt. In the same way as for Pope, and in the words of David Morris, paradox is a way not of recommending or embellishing truth, but of recognizing and expressing it. Such a stratagem would not be fighting paradoxical morality with mere popular prejudice, superstition, and ceremony, but surely with a scholarly, enlightened critic's mind. Well, I couldn't resist ending without a, a, a brief um, joke, as it were, uh, and that is that I think I could have delivered that um, talk in about two minutes. <laughs> the um, uh, way in which I could have done it was really to just uh, end, well, say to you two quotations and ask if you can imagine um, in which of these worlds shame would be the most fulfilling, if you like, um, as, a, as a sense of self-identity or self-development in the virtues. The first is Rousseau's, and it's a quotation from his Reveries of the Solitary Walker. So this is the man of paradoxical morality. I would have loved my fellow men in spite of themselves. It was only by ceasing to be human that they could forfeit my affection. The second, believe it or not, takes us back one last night, time to the notebook by Edmund Burke. And this is what he writes. Why should I desire to be more than a man? I have too much reverence for our nature to wish myself divested even of the weak parts of it. Thank you. <laughs>